All right, well, first thing I'd like to do is talk about a few news stories. There's always lots of interesting security news. And uh, so after the spectacular success of GLP-1 weight loss drugs, they're developing a lot of new ones. And so here's this one still being tested in mice, but I think they've begun testing it in humans now because it works so well. It seems to cure most of the problems of overweight with less side effects than the existing GLP ones. Um, so that's, uh, it sounds good. University of Copenhagen. Um, <coughs> there's an enormous demand for these things so much that people can't get them. Hopefully they'll manufacture more of them of various types. So here's a cheerful thought in India. You know, um, I've heard a few other nations that are poor where the uh, leaders start working 50 and 60 hour weeks, but this guy said 70 hour weeks is what's needed and he used to work 100 hour weeks and the whole idea of a 40 hour week and a weekend is just stupid and wrong. And uh, Certainly, that's what earlier generations thought. And uh, it's an endless struggle. I remember there was a famous video that went viral about a year ago where like a 20-year-old uh, a or something got her first job and she said, this is horrible. I have to commute every day. I have no time to do anything. And you know, she's not wrong. A job is a huge intrusion on your life. Uh, a couple centuries ago, nobody had jobs. You all lived on subsistence farms and you worked on the farm with your family, but you didn't go somewhere else and report to a boss. And when that first came out, where people having to, started having to go to the city and work in a factory, everybody complained and rebelled and said, this is unnatural and horrible and destroying our family. And, you know, I always thought that once machines got better, we'd go back to that, sort of live in the country on a farm. And so we'll see. But anyway, I, a lot of people were sneering and laughing at this millennial for saying what a drag a job is, but I think they're wrong. Jobs really are a drag. And, and they haven't always been there, and they won't always be there. Anyway. Um, However, the, in India, he says people should be working 70 to 100 hours a week, because, and this is what Gandhi said too, India is a very poor country, and uh, maybe short work weeks is a luxury that they can't afford at this time. That's another discussion worth having. So this one I've never seen before. Um, so GitHub has been getting malicious commits, um, and the person who made the commits forged the from address and the from IP address in order to make it look like another developer is making those commits to get that developer in trouble. So uh, innocent looking code commit, um, which would add a bunch of stuff which would turn out to be Unicode IP address, which would download malware. And um, it appears to be submitted from evil dojo 666 that had been deleted. But they somehow made it, they made it they, they're trying to frame evil dojo, who is a famous security researcher. So. Uh, this is something I remember having discussions about 20 years ago, like could you frame somebody else for a terrible crime like child porn, and that did happen at that time. Somebody went and uploaded and put child porn on their boss's computer at work, hoping they would get in trouble for it. So it is a, uh, a real concern where you commit a crime and you frame somebody else for it to get them in trouble. Just check for comments in the Twitch, no new ones. All right. So uh, this I thought was pretty interesting and it helps you understand how privilege escalation flaws work. This Ubuntu Linux has had this flaw for 10 years and nobody noticed. There is a, a process called need restart, which goes on machines. And I think this is the one I've seen this when you log into a cloud machine, it says your machine needs a restart to put on the latest update. Um, and that is a utility running on Linux to notify you of that. But it turns out that that utility is really old and really vulnerable. Um, it has ridiculous flaws of the type you used to get commonly 20 years ago. So it runs a Python interpreter, but the Python path environment variable is extracted from running processes. So you can change that environment variable. And when it thinks it's launching Python, you can make it launch anything it wants and it launches that with root privileges. And there's a whole, it's all similar like that. There's a Ruby interpreter, vulnerable, and so on. There's just various, uh, this thing was just written uh, to run with high privileges and not very safely. So. Uh, I just learned about this today. One of my pen tester friends asked me if I knew a good vulnerability scanner for AI large language models. And I said, no, I know some libraries of questions that large language models cannot answer, which gives you some way to demonstrate that they're not reliable. But he wants to do a, a, a penetration test, a vulnerability scan, and there is one. I didn't know it existed. I just found out about it, called GERAC, the Large Language Model Vulnerability Scanner that claims it will detect hallucination, data leakage, prompt injection, and so on. So uh, that's very interesting, and I'm going to have to add it to my AI class or use this thing and see how well it works. Um, it's 
not obvious to me how you can test for those things in an automated way, but uh, there has been some attempt to do it here, and people say it looks pretty good. So anyway, uh, a valuable product. And here's another article in many saying, you know, um, over the last couple of years, everyone said we're going to fire all our staff and replace it with AI. And more and more people are realizing that is not going to happen. And they surveyed job seekers, and they found that 69% of them doubt that AI will improve their work performance. 62% lack that it, doubt that it will even reduce their workload. Other studies have shown that people that are forced to use AI at work generally report that it makes their job more difficult and does not save them any time. It just wastes their time trying to use a new product that isn't really worth much, and so on. So it's interesting. They say nobody wants it except sales teams. And I think that's the only people that do like it is marketing teams. It's good at writing a bunch of text, which people are not going to read carefully. So like advertising copy, that it can do. Uh, more serious things it really can't do, as well as a human. So Oakland published a financial report. As you probably know, San Francisco and Oakland are always in dire financial straits. Uh, and Oakland in particular is in appalling financial straits. And they published two versions of the report. One of them had inflammatory language saying the whole city is going to go bankrupt. And then the mayor saw that and said, you can't say that. So he made a redacted report that no longer said that. But the first one got out and people started writing articles on it and stuff. So, you know, apparently they're in bad shape. And they would prefer not to admit it publicly. But they accidentally admitted it publicly. So. What happened? I really studied the economy of the whole city. What, what would happen if the city goes bankrupt? Oh, oh, it happened a couple times. It happened when I was a job seeker. They, they flew me to New York City to, um, they paid for me to, um, show up and apply for a job at City College New York and then New York went bankrupt and they couldn't hire anybody. It happened, I guess that was the 80s. Uh, if they go bankrupt then they can't pay anybody, not the cops, not the teachers, not anybody and they have to go have to do some kind of financial plan to like borrow some money or something and uh, restructure. Uh, in, it's like here, the community college districts, the one in San Francisco, was uh, going to be declared insolvent, the one I'm at, a couple times because you must have to keep a certain reserve, like 10% of your debt, of what you owe in reserve, and they weren't doing that. And if that happens enough, then they shut you down, they fire all your administration, and they administer it from the state. The state government will take over your school. So it, um, and they also can just close the place down, but if they don't close it down, they just fire all the management and replace the management with, with people from uh, Sacramento. That's kind of what would happen. And I think the federal government stepped in with some kind of bailout package, you know, what else can you do? They can't like kick everyone out of the city or shut down important stuff like the water or something. They they find some way to keep it going. I mean, it's not like worse. Well, um, it might even get better. I was, a lot of us actually thought it might be better for us if the college did fire all the administrators and be run by the state because our administrators are pretty bad. And people told me the state would be worse. And I'm not sure that's true at all. Anyway, um, yeah, absolutely. And so this, I'm glad to see, scientific fraud. Boy, I've run into this in my entire career. When I was a medical researcher at the early stages of my career, there was an enormous scandal from David Baltimore, who ran a cancer lab at one of the most prestigious cancer labs in the world, cancer research labs, and one of his graduate students had just falsified research, making it look like his anti-cancer drugs were working. And it was so influential, for the next 10 years, everybody studied that kind of drug and had tons of reports before they finally figured out that the original report was just wrong. And that wasted an incredible amount of time and money on useless research. And this guy did it too. He claimed to have a high-temperature superconductor. And various people have claimed this. It's almost always been bogus. And now he's actually been debunked. His papers have been retracted. And he has been fired. So it's good to see that there is some um, success at actually removing the fraud in science. Uh, all right. And I just learned about this, too, on the way in. Um, this is a really common problem people have. I've got it, too. You're running stuff at home, and you want to access it when you're away from home. So what do you do? Well, you could open a port on your home router and connect to your home devices, but then bad guys could come in that port. So another thing you could do is add a virtual private network connection to your home, like um, Tailscale is a popular one. But this is one they say is better and easier. I have tried to use Cloudflare. I did not know Cloudflare offered this service. I know about the reverse proxy service to protect your web server, which I use, which is great and free. And this is apparently also free. So you can log in through Cloudflare and tunnel into your home network with an agent that makes an outgoing connection from the home network, and it doesn't open the door for anybody else to come in. So he says, this is useful to a guy that says, I have like a server on my home network sharing up pictures and movies just for my family, 
and I just made my family an account on this service, and they can all log in through Cloudflare to see my stuff at home, and nobody else can get in. So it sounds extremely useful, and I'm going to be looking into it. So anyway, that's what I wanted to show you. I stop this.